Okay, if everybody's seated, we can kick off uh, for what's going to be two hours of tutorial on something that's called the X calculus. Uh, I'm Bob, and uh, I'm chief scientist at Continuum, and then some other stuff. Say some more about that later. Uh, so I'll, I'll give some references for what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, there is like a paper which I'm directly going to follow and that you can get on the archive. There is a book and another book. Let me show them. So this is the paper that I'm following. And this where, uh, so I'm basically going to do the same as I did a few months ago when Art Record asked me to give a couple of lectures on ZX calculus uh, for his students because they, they requested that. That's uh, in the maths department at Oxford University. Uh, now, this, so this, this is exactly what I'm going to follow today. Uh, there is also this book, Quantum in Pictures, by myself and Stefano Gogioso. And what's special about that book, I don't know if, if you can read it. Hello there, want to learn some quantum? Maybe you think you don't know enough maths. Well, that's not a problem. The pictures in this book are a new kind of maths that will teach you all about the quantum world. And then blah, 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 all the stuff we're going to see. Uh, so basically, this is a book this is, this, that's readable by people who don't know any maths. So basically, what you're going to learn today about is a new way to do quantum mechanics, which you can actually do very sophisticated stuff, but for which you don't know, need to know any maths, really. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, now, if you want to delve a bit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to assume that you know a little bit of Hilbert space today. I'm going to assume that you know a tiny bit of Dirac notation, the dude which seems to have been lecturing here, too. Uh, right. OK, so if you want to delve a bit, bit deeper into it later, then there is also this book with Alex Kissinger, which is called The Dode Book. And uh, that's, 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 that's a course at Oxford University, third years, fourth year students. And that actually teaches you Hilbert space from the pictures. So you start with the pictures, and then you explain how Hilbert space falls out of that. And, uh, just, just, like, just as a teaser, what you see here is a full description of quantum teleportation, which the dodo is thinking about. Even an extinct animal, probably soon not extinct anymore, I've heard, but an extinct animal can do quantum teleportation in pictures. OK, so let me give some introduction. Where did ZX calculus come from? So ZX calculus uh, goes back to 2007. And uh, Ross Duncan, who's the head of quantum software at Quantinium, myself, we sort of came up with it within a line of research which was called categorical quantum mechanics and which required you to, to know a hell of a lot of mathematics. So it's, it actually started as a super abstract thing, all this, and then it became like a baby thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it started a long time ago, but it took quite a while before people actually started to pick it up. The community started to pick it up. Uh, and I can give a sociological talk about that, why that is the case. I won't do that. Uh, but like now, 
more recently, it's, it's very widespread in quantum industry, and that's why you're getting two hours of it. So this is a paper by Psi Quantum, which is the largest photonic quantum computing company. And uh, they, they just use this as their main language. They use an only speak this sort of language. Like the Z-calculus is immensely useful graphical. So it's especially in quantum optics that it's pretty much impossible, quantum photonics, to just use Hilbert space language. It's too complicated. It's, it's a big mess. And with these, these, these diagrams, which you're going to learn about today, things become actually quite easy. And uh, so all the photonic people are using it, not just, not just Psi quantum. And then more recently, this is Peter Shore, who you must know about. So he's also now starting to advocate uh, CX calculus for error correction. He said, like, everybody who does error correction should actually be doing this. That's what he said. And he's teaching CX calculus at MIT now. So this just, so, and, but this is all quite recent, you see, 2023. Okay, this doesn't have a date. I think this was 2022. It's like recently there has been a boom in this stuff. People start to realize how valuable this was. Uh, so these are now all the companies I know of using it. So again, that's all very recent development uh, for whatever reason. Okay, Let, let's start with the, with the meat. So we're going to talk about something which I will call process theories. So process theory is a theory, not like all your theories of physics you've ever been taught about, uh, where you start with a kinematic description and then a dynamic description. Process theories are theories where you start with processes. So the basic, the basic entity of your the theory is processes and the way you compose and plug processes together. That's sort of the, the basic ingredient of the theory. And just to give you some history, a long time ago, not in Italy, but in Greece, some 2,400, 2,500 uh, years ago, there were two, two, two people. One was called Heraclides, and the other one was called Parmenides. And Parmenides said, the, the, the world is always in a static picture. And the world is really a bunch of pictures just placed after each other. So, but at any moment of time, there is a static picture. And, Par and Heraclides said, no, no, no. The only thing which exists is flux and process. And they, they were arguing a lot, and they were arguing a lot. And what happened historically is that everybody was following Parmenides. So now we get the theory of physics. They first give you a static picture, which they call kinematics. Right? And quantum mechanics has a Hilbert structure. And then they sort of generate dynamics over it. So we are going, so we are going back all the way to, to Heraclitus, who's starting with processes. The only person who kind of has been going in that direction, like was Whitehead, the mathematician Whitehead, philosopher in the previous century. He had what he called process uh, ontologies. But here it's, it's a bit different. And uh, the, sort of the way we write things down is, for us, a system is a wire. A wire is something where you can think a quantum particle or a classical particle or some food or some water or some electricity or whatever can flow. So things flow in wires. And here you said, see, I've got multiple wires next to each other, so multiple things can flow through the wires in parallel. And a box is something that acts on wires. Uh, so this could be in quantum, a quantum measurement. This could be classically a computer program. This could be an oven in which you put your food and then cook it. So this can be a lot of stuff. And so we got these wires and boxes, and they are going to be the basis ingredients of our language. And then we're going to look at some very special wires and bo uh, boxes. So, if got a, so we, we read these diagrams from bottom to top, just by convention. And if you have no input, if you have no input, and only outputs, then we call it a state. A state is something uh, that's given. I mean, it's the result of some process. You don't know where it started. You don't know where it came from. But it's, the it's, the result of so oh, sorry. it's the result of some process. And you can act on it. You can do stuff with it. Yeah, that's what a state is. Something you, you don't care where it came from. You've got it, and you can do stuff with it. And then the dual notion, where you only got inputs and outputs, is something we call an effect or a test. You, it's, it's, it's basically like verifying when, whether something is the case. Uh, so these are, these are or a question. You can think of this as a question and effect. Uh, so question, test, blah, blah, blah. It's all the same. And, and this is actually, so there was this, there, there was this person, Dirac, who's been, who had been writing on this board, I was told, a while back. So actually what I've been teaching you is Dirac stuff. So here you see, this is my triangle where some wire comes out, no input. I rotate this a little bit, and then I chop off the corners, and then I get a cat. I take this triangle, this effect, eh? I chop off the corners on this bit, and I get a bra. 
And if I compose these two and do the same, I get a bracket. So, so Dirac notation is really an instance of these wires and in boxes stuff. It's, 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 so basically what we're doing is a two-dimensional generalization because you can both, so, so if you compose cats and brass, that would be this direction. That would be like the vertical direction. But we can also compose wires horizontally with the tensor product. I don't know whether you ever tried using usual direct notation and try to describe something like entanglement swapping. It's a complete mess. It's a complete mess with indices and all that because quantum physics doesn't want to live on a line. It wants to live in the plane. Because you've got these two different compositions. You've got composition in time, and then you've got tensoring, uh, tensor, or what do I do? Tensoring systems. You see, tensoring system is another dimension than composition in time. And that's why these things want to live in two dimensions. Uh, and, and, and that's what it is all about. I mean, I mean, this field started under the name categorical quantum mechanics, like going like for this two-dimensional uh, representation. Then, then, then now, now we call it process theories. In the middle, it was kind of called quantum picturalism or something like that. Uh, OK, so the, there are numbers. Numbers are boxes without inputs and outputs. A box without an input and output, that's a number. You can think of it as a probability or something like that. You can think of it as a probability or something like that. And what's special about the numbers is because they have no wires to constrain them, they can just dance around each other. They just dance around each other. They're completely free. You can stick them wherever in the picture you want. It doesn't matter anything. And OK, I've got a question. Uh, what, would, what would be the meaning of an empty picture? So if I just would have a blackboard with nothing on it, what would be the meaning? Any guess? Huh? Uh, yeah, that's true. No system, nothing. But, but, but it's, it would be the number one. Would be the number one because you can adjoin it to everything. I can I can take this picture and stick stick an extra bit of black bl blackboard to it and nothing changes. So it's the number one. Doesn't change anything. Uh, right. Okay. So now the, the main thing you can do with these boxes, you can compose them. You see here, here I composed a bunch of boxes and I get like a process with inputs and outputs. Here I composed some, but there is no input. So this is like a composite state, and this is a composite number. So a pro, so, some some diagram like this. Without inputs or outputs, that's, that's just a number again. So that's how probabilities rise in a thing like this, in a theory like this. OK. Now I'm going to, so these were, were general boxes and wires. And now I'm going to go to very specific boxes and wires. And this is the, the notation or the language of the X calculus. And they will be representing very special linear maps. I mean, you, you can also interpret these things in other theories than linear maps. In, 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 absurd toy theories and stuff like that. This is still possible. But for today, we're going to just stick to linear maps and, 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 and stuff like that. OK, there they are. That's the X notation. So we got this green dot with a bunch of wires coming in and a bunch of wires coming out. And that's what we call a Z spider, Z, from the Z observable. And then you got this red dot here with a number of wires coming in and a number of wires going out. And this we call the X spider. Why do we call them spiders? Because they look like spiders. I mean, I, there is a technical name for these things. And if you prefer a technical name, you can use that. And I always have to think hard for what the technical It's a special dagger commutative Frobenius algebra. That's what it is. But I think spider is kind of better. OK. Uh, Sorry, but yeah? What's the oh, okay, I'll explain. They are different things. I'll tell you otherwise they would, wouldn't be, have different colors. I'm going to define them now. So they are different things. They are two different things. And uh, I'll explain now what exactly they are. I'll use some Dirac notation for that. Uh, but yeah, the reason for these colors is Ros Duncan and I, we were in my office in 2007, and I had two pens, a red and a green one. That we gave the, this a lot of deep thought. Right. So, so here is the definition to answer the question. So the way you define these things, I'm now defining them in the case of qubits, just for a two-dimensional Hilbert space, is you basically take the sum of like a cat. Here, here I've got n inputs. So I take a bra with n inputs here with zeros, a bra with n inputs here with ones, and then I take the cat with the number of outputs. 
zeros and zeros, and then I add them up. So that's the definition. That's the definition of the, of the, of the Z spider. Now, this definition of the X spider, and see what I've changed, I've changed the choice of bases. Here I take the plus bases and the minus bases instead of the zero and the one bases. So that's why I called these ones, oh, sorry. Up, up. Yeah. That's why I called these ones, these ones I called Z spiders because I used Z bases. And this one I call X spiders because I use the X bases. And that's the difference. And are they different? What do you think? We look at some examples. Let's look at some examples. So anyway, you know this. I don't have, do you know this basis, this notation? Just in case, everybody knows this? Yeah, so zero, one, and yeah, I'm assuming very little here. Okay, here are some examples. So this is the, co well, oh, wait, let me write this down. So this would be zero, 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 plus one, one, one. So that would be the first spider there. So this one, this one you see, it has two, uh, two outputs and one input. Now if I would, would write down the same for plus and minus, would I get the same thing? Yeah? What do you think? So what is this thing doing? If I stick in a zero, zero state, I get a zero, zero out. If I stick in a one state, I get one, one out. Now, so, so they, they just get copied. Zero and one get copied. Is there any other state that would be copied by this thing? Any other state that would be copied by this thing? Indeed, by the no-cloning theorem, we know that if an, an, if an operation copies two states, then these states must be orthogonal. There are only two orthogonal states on a qubit, the zero and the one. I mean, there's no, no third one which is orthogonal to all of them. So this operation would just copy zero and one and nothing else, nothing else. So if you stick in, for example, the plus state, you get the bell state out. And if you stick in the plus state, you get a bell state out, you get this one plus this one. Now, if I do the same for, the, uh, for this one, this copy, this one would only copy the plus state and the minus state and nothing else. So they are generally very different things. More than, more than that, this thing, if I give you this one, or this one, or any other such, maybe for another base spider, then this, this operation alone gives you bases. It defines a basis, it characterizes the basis as those elements that are copied by it. So this is actually a representation of a basis. And we have, I'm not gonna go into it, but um, we have a theorem, which is a non-trivial theorem, and that is, if you take all the spiders of one color, say the green ones, and then you put some rules on it, which we're going to see later, the, the rules which uh, define the behavior of the spiders, then they're always in one-to-one -one correspondence with orthonormal bases. So the, question, the answer to the question, the colors, what do they mean? They mean orthonormal bases. So each family of spiders, each color corresponds to an orthonormal base. I, I, could, I could take lots of, I could a whole, take a whole rainbow for lots of different bases if you want to. Sometimes people use the blue for the, for the Y uh, observable, we, we won't need it. So okay, so here are, so this is a copy, this would be a delete for this color, copy and delete. And the, so okay, if we now look at, at just one input and one output, so this is actually only one zero and one zero there, and one one and one then there. You get identity. And of course, the identity is the same for both colors. So the identity is an example of a spider. If you take this one, so that's actually, this is not there, there's no inputs. The inputs are gone, but you get zero, zero, plus one, one, bell state. This is the bell state. This is the bell state, and it's the same for both bases. And this will be the bell effect, and the same for both bases. Anybody can, guess, anybody can guess what this is? Huh? Louder? So you, you have no inputs, you have no inputs, and zero, 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 plus one, one, one. That's a G at Z state. That's G at Z state. No, that's G at Z state. So you see, with the spiders, you can already represent quite, these people call this coherent copying relative to a basis, so you can represent them. You've got the cups, the bell state, bell effects, 
GNC state and some other stuff. So, so some things you can already write on. Now, spiders aren't good enough or, or rich enough for us. We also, like many spiders in nature, we want the spiders to carry a decoration. And this decoration would be something that in the definition is just a phase difference between the first term and the second term. So this, so this is like a little bit more notation, and uh, we call them phases. We just call them phases. Uh, they, these things actually, for totally abstract reasons, from uh, spiders being a dagger special community for Venus algebras, they all, for abstract reasons, they always form a group. And of course, this is the circle, eh, because it's the circle of phases on the, on the equator of the block sphere, right? This is the circle of phases on the equator of the block sphere. Okay, so we do the same for the other color. We do the same for the other color. We stick also possible phases in there. And now, then this is now a general ZX diagram. It would be a bunch of spiders plugged together, and they may carry phases. So this is a ZX diagram. It looks like this. So you could call it spider web or something like that. Spider web. This is a general ZX diagram. Uh, are there any questions? I should stop. Are there any questions at this point? No? Yeah? Yeah, so, like I said before, we, we usually read these things from top to bottom. But actually, it's a good question because the nature of these spiders and their symmetries are such that it actually doesn't matter. If I, if I, if I turn this picture upside down, and, and of course, I need to keep track which, which, which open ends. I have to give these open end names. But however I orient it, it's not going to change. It's not going to change because of the symmetries, because of the symmetries of these things. They are very symmetric, as, as, as you see from the definition. <laughs> see, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, you, if the, it depends what you're going to do with it. You, so we will use this to describe quantum circuits. And then, of course, you want to keep track of what is the inputs and what is the, uh, are the outputs. But if I take such a leg and I, I build, I can just flip it up and down, and it's just another spider. So, the, so, so the, I'll, I'll show this later. The, the, these things have so much symmetry, and actually, the power, the power of calculating in ZX calculus, is that as compared to say quantum circuits, is that you can forget that you're dealing with unitaries and circuits, and you can do sort of much more wilder manipulations, as we shall see. And we will see intermediate steps in calculations, which don't for. for rewriting circuits which don't look like circuits anymore at all. You'll see that. And that's actually where the power comes from. I mean, it's a little bit like complex analysis. Complex analysis is about real systems, re re real, real numbers. But by going into the complex, you can actually do much easier calculations. And it's, it's a little bit what's happening here, too. Let's see. Okay, So I'm, I'm going to give some more examples. So the phase spider, this is a phase gate. This is just the, the, the usual phase gate with phase alpha. Uh, you can see this. Let me go back. See, if, if I got just one input and one output, so then there is only one zero here and one zero there, and one one there and one one there. So you got a one. So the, di the off diagonal elements are zero, and on diagonal you got a one and this phase. So it's a phase gate. It's a phase gate. Uh, so this 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 red pi turns out to be a not gate. This turns out to be an OK, so that's cool. And here is one of the beautiful things. If you stick a green spider and a red spider together like this, which is actually the same as doing this, and that's, again, the symmetry I was talking about, where it doesn't really matter what you consider as inputs and outputs. And because it's the same, we write like that. And this is C not gate. This is C not gate. So you, mo, your, all your basic gates are starting to fall out already for quantum circuits. And, and the fact that you can actually decompose a C0 gate in two pieces which are very well behaved also gives you a lot of power to, to calculate or reason about quantum circuits. The fact that you can actually break up something like a C0 gate in two pieces. And see, these two pieces, they mean nothing anymore. They can't be unitary because they got three legs. You can never turn this into unitary. But that's actually where the power comes from. And the, if you take the, the zero and the pi spider, this would be the zero state, and this would be the one state. So don't get confused. So the red, red gives a basis for green, and green gives a basis for red. The basis vectors of, uh, of green are actually these red points, and the basis vectors of red are actually these green points. Hmm? 
So, so a, a lot of so you see this, this this language is very expressive already in the sort of things we can write down in it. Okay, so now I'm going to prove I'm going to show a theorem, and that's about universality of the excellent test. So universality means that whatever matrix you give me, I can write it down. Any matrix you ever give me, I can write it down like this. Any matrix you can write down like this, like as as such a spider web. Uh, okay, so and I'm not going to give a full proof, but I'm give, going to give a hint of a proof, so that's what I just said. Any linear map between cube, qubits can be written down as spider in the way I just, so that's universality. Okay, how do you prove that? Uh, basically, it's a known fact, and I'm not going to prove that because you can find this in books, that if you've got C0 gate and phase gates, you can express any unitary. That's, sort of a, that's a no fact like from C0 gate and phase gate, you can express any unitary, and they're both made up of spiders, so we can express any unitary. Now, let me apply this to the zero state. So these are the zero states. These are the zero states. I apply an arbitrary unitary to the zero states, so I can get an arbitrary state, of course. I can get an arbitrary state. Eh? If, I can have, if I've got arbitrary unitaries, I apply them to zero, I can send these zeros to any state I want. If I can pick the unitary freely. So, so we got now any state. And then the next thing is we take any state, and we're going to take, for example, these n outputs, and we bend them into inputs, and we take these m outputs and leave them to be outputs. And this is, this is called choi jamlokovsky or map state duality. From any state, you can get any linear map if you do that. So in this way, we can actually represent any linear map. In the Dota book, we give a much more elegant proof of this fact, not relying on existing work. But so we got on a universe. So these spiders are a universal language for, for, for linear maps. So that, that's kind of cool. Uh, OK, now, so far, this was just a language for expressing things. It's a good language because you can express everything. But the real, the real meat is in actually how you're going to calculate with these things. And so here are the rules of the X calculus. And what makes them so, so good is that they are so simple. OK, here, this is the spider. Let's call this spider fusion rules. It can't get any simpler. If you've got two spiders which are connected, they become one spider. It's not difficult. Eh? It's not difficult. So, and this is true for the, for the green color. So it's a very, very simple rule. This afternoon, so I'm going to give a lecture this afternoon, which is more about the research in quantum AI and stuff like that. But then I'll, I'll, I'll give another intuition about, about this particular rule and why it's so cool. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to focus on just listing them. So the same is true for the red ones. I mean, th this is not something that's hard to remember, right? This is not something that's hard to remember. That, that's the whole point. And OK. And now this is something that I was saying earlier about the symmetries. If you take, for example, if you take a spider, and then I sort of unfuse this with a cup. So this is a cup spider. It's a cup spider, another spider. So I, I take this wire, I infuse it. Then this is actually just a cup. I can basically then pull it all the way down so that it actually becomes an input of a spider, and then I can bend it down in an output. So, it's, 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 so inputs and outputs are very interchangeable with these beasts. And that, that, that's, that's part of the power, again, that, that you can do all these things with them, that they're so flexible. Right, OK, the phases, so what happens to the phases? Well, they just get added up if they fuse. They just get added up. Think of it, this is the genetic material of one spider, this is genetic material of the other spider, and they combine. That's how simple it is. Very simple rule. Same for the red ones. Oh, OK. Here is, so, so what happens? I'm going to check. Is there a clock? Are there clocks in here? Oh, yeah, there's a clock there. OK, that's good. Now, what happens if a green spider meets a red spider? That's, of course, where, where interesting stuff is going to happen. So as it happens to be the case, if they are connected by two wires, these wi wires fall away. If a green spider is connected to a red spider, and, and there's two wires, these wires fall away. I think I've got a, so this is sort of a, yeah? Yes, yes, very important. So, so it's, so, one, one just stays. If one wire would fall away, these two things would never get connected. <laughs> so that would be, that would, we would have like a silly theory 
So it's really, and I'll explain what it means. I'll explain what it means. I'll explain what it means later. Why, why it's so, what, what's the intuition behind this? So first, let's, let's write a very simple, this is sort of a simpler version of the same. Eh? So I got green and red connected, two in the middle, they fall away. Eh? So that's, that's a simpler version of the same. You can actually show that this equation is equivalent. So we, remember, green is a basis and red is a basis. They're both orthonormal basis. Eh? They all, they, because of the, the, co the copying operation, determines an orthonormal base. So the way you have to think about it is like, this is the relation between two orthonormal bases. Can anybody guess which relation this could be? What is, what is the sort of one special relation two orthonormal bases can, can have? Huh? I don't hear it. No. Uh, do, does that, did anybody ever hear about mutual unbiasedness? Mutual unbiasedness. So mutual unbiasedness, so this, this is an expression of mutual unbiasedness. Mutual unbiasedness means if I've got two orthonormal bases, yeah, for example, we're going to call them red and green here, and I take a, a, a basis vector of the red basis, then it will have equal probability to all the basis vectors of the green basis. So a basis vector of one basis has equal probability to the basis vectors of the other basis. So they're sort of maximally apart. They're maximally apart. On the block sphere, on the block sphere, it means they're orthogonal. On the block sphere, it means they're orthogonal like z and x. So it's a special relation that bases can have. And this equation exactly expresses that relation. And we're going to see this even in operational terms uh, later. So this is a very important relation. So basically what we got here, we've got two... They, in the old days, they used to call that complementarity, complementary basis, and examples were position and momentum. They were complementary basis. So they were the first one people were talking about, position and momentum. But other complementary basis are Z and X, or X and Y, or Y and Z. They're all complementary or mutual unbiased, because I'll repeat, if you take a basis vector of one of them, then it will have equal probability to the basis vectors of the others. Um, that's mutual unbiased. So we, we got two bases now in a very special relationship. And, okay, <clears throat> so we, we, we initially called this complementarity. So it's a very important relation. Like these bases are maximally far apart. <coughs> but then we discovered something really weird. We discovered that also Z and X satisfy these relations. Z and X also satisfies these relations, the Z and X spiders. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll explain what they mean. I'll, explain, I'll, I'll, I'll analyze them a little bit more. The, the two on the right are quite simple. They're saying the, the, red, the zero basis vector is copied by the Z spider. I mean, this is something I explained here. Right? This one copies zero and one. And that's actually exactly what this, this is saying. The red dot was the zero state. This, if you take the zero state and, the, and that green spider, you get two zero states. And this is saying that if I take the plus state, and the red spider, and I get two plus states. So basically, this is the expression of the copying. Now, what, what kind of a beast is this? What kind of a beast is this? Uh, in mathematics, it's something that was, again, known. And uh, people call this a bialgebra. This is a bialgebra. Uh, <coughs> it was a known thing. But in, in, in this context, with spider, but it, they didn't express it ever with spiders. They did this for what's called a monoid and a commonoid, not for the spiders. OK, let me see. This, this, uh, this equation, which the mathematicians usually write like this, I prefer to write like this. So basically what you got here, you got a four cycle. You got a four cycle of spiders. And then what you can do is you say a number of these outputs. You take everything that's connected to red and connected to green. You see four and two, they're connected to red there. And here four and two are connected to green. I take everything that's connected to green which is one and three, one and three, I connect them to red, and then I connect these two colors. Uh, so basically, what this, what, this do, what this is doing for me, it takes a square and it gets rid of it. It gets rid of squares in my, in my spider web. That's what it does. Let's now go back to the previous one. What does this do? This one gets rid of two cycles. This one gets rid of two cycles. And we now, 
do you think you could use this equation to prove the one for getting rid of squares? Just use your intuition. Never, eh? because this just talks about two cycles. It says nothing about squares. So it turns out, it turns out that this equation is much, these three equations together are much stronger than this one, uh, than, than this one. Well, what is it? Than this one. This one can actually be derived. This one can be derived from these ones. I'll do this now. So that's the first calculation you're going to see. So like I said, like uh, mathematicians ri write that one like this, but I prefer to write it like, like, like this, just getting rid of squares. OK, let's show. So, so I start with this left-hand side here. And now I want to use my square, my getting rid of squares relation to do something with this. So basically what I do, I create a square. You see, I pull out this green spider. I pull out this red spider. You remember, identity, like a spider with one input and one output is just an identity, right? Spider with one input and one output is just an identity. Let me go back, because we're using that here. Oh, I'll go all the way back. Oh, there are my examples. So we're using this now. We're using this now. Now the plain wire, I can stick a red dot on, or I can stick a green dot on. And then, then I can use my. Okay, here. Then I can use my spider rules, but I'm going to use them from right to left. I'm going to use them from right to left. I can pull out a spider. If I got one spider, I can pull out a second one. Uh, like from right, like like what was the gremlins did that? Has anybody ever seen this movie Gremlins? Uh, like if you throw water on them, then other gremlins pop, popped out of them or something. I mean, you can do this here. This happens with the spiders too. So, so, so okay. Where is the calculation? Okay, there's the calculation. So, you see. I create a bit of identity here, a bit of identity here. I put a red dot on it, a red dot there, a green dot, and then I pull another dot out. That's what I was just explaining, yeah? Does, does that everybody understand this step? Yeah, so actually, I c and now you see I've got a square. I've got a square. So since I've got a square, I can use this. I can use this. And, I, and you could check, I exactly did this. So now, this, this red will now be connected to a green. And this green will now be connected to a red. This green will now be connected to a red. Because really, really what happens here is the green, oh, sorry. The green and red, whatever's connected to green becomes red, whatever's con connected to red becomes green. So it's like a commutation. It's a bit like a commutation of the two colors. Now, let's go again back. You remember these rules. Red copy, a green copy is red, red copy is green. We go on. Oh, no, that's not the one. OK, so here you see red gets copied. So this red one goes through this green one and becomes two red dots. Yeah? This, you have to sort of see, look at this sideways, but it's really this red one is copied through this green one. This green one is copied through this red one. And so it comes out, it comes out, and then there is these two things. And this is just a number. Let's not care about it. It's just a number. Ugh. We don't care about it. And so what remains is this. So we actually derived. We derived this one from this one. And so since this one was called complementarity, we call this strong complementarity. It's, 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 it's a really weird thing, but so it turns out that many bases, many orthonormal bases, not at all all pairs, but many pairs of unbiased or complementary orthonormal bases are subject to stronger equations than the unbiasedness alone. And they are very powerful equations, and they were, no, they were not known. Nobody knew them in quantum computing. No, nobody used them in quantum computing, and they're very useful. They're actually turning out to be very useful, these equations. These, very useful. We're going to see in examples. Uh, oh, good. OK, another equation that, that you actually can derive from the previous ones, which I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do this. But again, this is basically, this equation is copying the one state, so the, the, the the z copy copies the one state, and the x copy copies the minus state. That's really what these equations are saying. So the, these equations are all just about copying of basis states. This one, I'm not going to derive them, but this one you can derive from what we just saw before. They are derivable. OK, leave it like that. 
And then, for some, I mean, this is, this is a gate you don't really need because you can actually, exp see, this is the Hadamard gate. Hadamard gate, and do, does everybody know Euler angle decompositions? Yeah, so Euler angle decomposition is when you decompose uh, something like the Hadamard gate by certain rotations of the sphere, typically along the z and the x-axis. So you can actually decompose the Hadamard gate in rotations along the z and the x uh, axis of 90 degrees. These are, these are rotations of 90 degrees. Uh, this is along the, the z axis, this is along the x axis. So you can actually define the Hadamard gate like that. And then you can show that actually the Hadamard gate becomes a color changer. If I take a green spider and I sort of sandwich it between Hadamard gates, it becomes a red one. And that's a ve very useful thing to have around. It's a very useful thing to have around uh, for calculations. So that's, that's some extra notation we usually introduce, especially if you do quantum circuits and stuff like that. So the Hadamard gate is a color changer. So, so I mean, so the spider fusion is very easy. Spider fusion is very easy. Color change here is very easy. Uh, copying is very easy to remember, the copying. So this is really the only one which is a little bit more difficult to remember. Huh? Okay, let, yeah, that's the one which is more difficult to remember, so I'll re-explain. Re so you see a square here, a square, and of course a square is alternating colors, otherwise it would fuse together in something smaller. And so you've got a square with alternating colors. And I've, no, I've labeled the four wires that go out. So what you do then is you look at all the wires that are connected to green. This is number one and number three, and you connect them to a red dot. You take all the wires which are connected to red, that's number two and number four, and you connect them to a green dot, and then you connect the two dots. Oh, it means nothing, means nothing, means nothing. These are wires. I mean, I mean, you should look at the mess of the, the wires here. They, they, they are knotted and stuff like that. It doesn't matter. They, so, yeah, important for those people who, who, who know something about knot theory, there is no knots here. So those people who know a lot of topology, uh, these diagrams actually live in four dimensions. We, we draw them on a plane, but mathematically they live in four dimensions because in four dimensions there are no knots. I don't know whether you knew that. If you, if you go to four dimensions, knot theory in four dimensions is really worth a, a very interesting PhD thesis. It's an empty one because there's no knots. So knots is a very typical thing for three dimensions. In four, so, so in, in print, I mean, we write them on a plane, but basically the thing is you can think of wires just moving through each other like electricity wires. It doesn't matter. With electricity wires, it doesn't matter well, how, they, how they're sort of configured. But yeah, that was a good remark, so it doesn't matter. Okay, right. So, so I've almost shown you, so there is actually, there's actually one more rule of the XCAL, because I'm not even going to write it out. And it's something like this. It tells you how you can actually swap the colors of, a, of like a green face, red, and, and, and a green face to a red face, green face. I'm not going to explain it, because we never use it. We never use it. Now, why do I give it? That, why do I give it this rule if we never use it? Because there is a very important theorem. And this theorem says completeness of the X calculus. This is not some, some notion which is typically known to physicists. It's not something physicists ever would write about. Uh, and it's because in the nature of physics is done with like uh, a static Hilbert space and then you generate dynamics on it. P ph physicists don't think in terms of these rewrite rules. So what does completeness mean? Any equation that holds for linear maps between qubits can be derived in the X calculus from the above stated rules. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is quite something. This means anything you can do with linear algebra, any equation you can derive using matrices and all that, anything, anything you can do with those rules I just showed you. So which rules do we have? We have these ones, we have these ones, spider fusion. We had. Oh, sorry, I'm going back too far. So we had spider, fu we had spider fusion, these ones, spider fusion. We had these ones, so the, the, the square, getting rid of the square, and the copying, getting rid of the square, and the copying. Uh, 
this, this is actually, this, this is just notation. This is the color change, the color change rule. And some rule which I'm not going to specify, which we never use anyway. We never use it. But you can show that any equation between matrices and all that, tensor products and everything in linear algebra can be derived from these rules. There's nothing more you can do in Hilbert space than what you can do with these spider rules. And that's, that's, that's what logicians call completeness. Complete, logician, so I'm, I'm going to talk a bit logic now. So logicians, so they, they axiomatize things. You take, for example, a model like Hilbert space, and then you write axioms down for Hilbert space. And then a complete axiomatization is that with your axioms, you can do everything that actually you can prove in the model. And so this is the same here, too. Whatever you can prove in the Hilbert space model, any equation, you can derive from this axiomatization, yeah? So classical bits can be, can be embedded in here. They can be, I'll, I'll show this later. They can be fully embedded. So we will, um, at the moment, I'm just talking about linear maps. Later, I'll talk about density matrices and stuff like that in this language. And then you can embed classical probability inside. And I'll show how you do that. I'll show. There's lots more to come. <laughs> There's lots more to come. So I'll show out. But this, this is an incredible result. This is a shocking result. I mean, I don't think anybody ever believed that when we started to do these things, that at any point, these diagrams could actually replace Hilbert space in, 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 in terms of what you can derive. But we are there now. This was proven 2018 for qubits. And a few weeks ago, with a, with a slightly different calculus, uh, we proved it for in all finite dimensions. We proved that you get a graphical calculus in all finite dimensions in which you can prove anything that you can prove for Hilbert spaces. So. Yeah, I mean, but that's known, huh? Yeah, it's, 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 it's similar. Of course, like, of course, the difference here is we're talking uh, about in, in, in class computation, you, you, you have a discrete model, a discrete model, zeros and ones and functions. So it's not entirely a surprise that you could come up with such a discrete axiomatization. You were talking about continuous Hilbert spaces. So it's, 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 it's less expected that you could come up with such a discrete axiomatization in any way. And, and what's also remarkable is how different this looks from Hilbert space. I mean, it's, not, it's not obvious. If, it, if you take, OK, I've got the little book here. If, if you're a physicist and you read this book, which, which explains nothing about Hilbert spaces, it's just all this uh, in its own right, it's non-trivial to connect this to Hilbert space if, you, if it hasn't been explained to you. It's non-trivial, the connection. And a funny thing is, if you go to Amazon, and then on the one end, you got like reviews by 10-year-olds saying this is a fantastic book. And then you got reviews by people saying, I'm a professional theoretical physicist. I do quantum information. And I think this is really difficult. Yeah, OK. <laughs> because they, want, they, they, can't, they can't, they don't have the capability because of ego and whatever else and training to take this on face value and forget what they already know. They need to translate to what they already know. And it's a very non-trivial translation. It's a highly non-trivial translation. So in a way, you have to unlearn something to, to, to really appreciate this stuff. I mean, I'm not going to give the proof. This is a really hard theorem. I, I didn't prove that. So, so much more people than me prove that. This is a really hard theorem. And people were looking for this for 10 years. But so this is, this, this is quite a big deal. This is quite a big deal. OK, let's now, yeah. Um, I would assume so. I would assume so. Now, now, there's of course like there is something about what you call nonlinearities if you're thinking quantum machine learning or something like that. Typically, nonlinearities people refer to stuff which is not unitary anymore because that's actually something which arises from nonlinear. Uh, a a non-linear non generalization of Schrodinger equations. And these things, these things, they exist inside. These things, so a lot of work has been done using this calculus. Is, is Richie here? Oh, lazy PhD students of mine. So, huh? Is he online? 
Okay, people are online. So, so, so people have been doing work like in, in quantum machine learning, looking for barren plateaus and stuff like that, using this sort of stuff. So, I mean, and uh, peop, I know, I know, I know, some of our people are now talking to Nathan for, about quantum chemistry and this sort of things. Uh, this, this is not something I'm going to talk about, but in the, the, the calculus I mentioned that that we recently proved completeness of in all dimensions. You can write down Hamiltonians, you can differentiate, you can integrate, you can exponentiate. I'm not going to talk about it today, but you can do it. So these calculi exist, and they're very recent. And then, then you can really do the, what, what physicists call real physics. Okay, let's do a very trivial little calculation. This is a very little and trivial calculation, just to show you the gist of calculating. So these are three C0 gates. This is a quantum circuit, three qubits, three C0 gates. Uh, it's a quantum circuit. I, said, I told you this is, these are C0 gates. So what do you do now? You want to see if you can simplify it. You want to compile. You want to compile. So basically, what you do is, I see red and red. I see green, green, green. I fuse. I see two wires in between. I throw away. I see a spider with only an input and an output. Yes, that's a plane wire. So you see how these, these simple rules basically help you. Sim this is a very trivial circuit, of course. This is a very trivial one. But this, this is kind of the idea we see how these simple rules. And this works for much more complicated examples, too. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, today, if I'm still up to date, the state of the art of quantum circuit optimization, meaning making a circuit as small as possible, is this. Sometimes combined with other methods, but this is the state of the art. I don't know, can somebody back me up? Is there, are there any quantum software people here? No? Because these things move back. But this one, this is, huh? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a hard problem. It's, it, no, I, don't, I don't think there are any results yet of like anybody saying, okay, this is the best you can do. It's, it's, just, it's, it's just a methodology to do as good as possible. Because exactly the reason you say. It's mostly a methodology to do as good as possible. And there are strategies which you can use here and do better than anything else. That's basic. And I'll show, I'll show what the strategy is in a bit. But you're right, of course. These, these are very complex problems. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, so that, that's what I just showed you, written down nicely on a blackboard on a line. Uh, right. So this is another one. So you see I've got three C0 gates, but now they're alternating on two qubits. So I've got C0 gate, swapped C0 gate, C0 gate. Now what you do, <coughs> you see there's a square there. See the square there. So what are we going to do now? So this one, this one stays, goes there. This one stays, goes there. And you see here again, one and three. One and three, they go to red. Two and four, two and four on red there. So they go to green, and I connect them. What you see now is I've got two C0 gates, but now the colors match. Now the colors match, so I can fuse them. They vanish, and so this is the same as the swap. Yep. <coughs> this is a slightly more involved example because you need the square elimination thing. Okay. Now, now I'm going to prove that the C0 gate is the C0 gate. I'm going to prove the C0 gate is the C0 gate. So this is my C0 gate, and I stick in the zero state. What happens with the zero state? I have a green dot, so it gets copied. It gets copied. You see, it gets copied through. So I've got these two red dots coming out. They fuse together. This is an identity. So if I stick in a zero in the control, C0 gate does nothing. It's identity. Now, if I stick in a one, so the pi is the one state, the one gets copied too. I get a pi there. Pi is not. I said pi gate is the not gate. Red pi is not. So if I put a one in the control, I get a not. 
on the other side. So I just showed here that this is indeed a C0 gate because it behaves as a C0 gate. <coughs> right? Uh, so now I'm going to show, so these were simple examples. So this is the sort of, this is a continuum paper, and this is about like really uh, compiling circuits as small as possible, making them as small as possible. So that's Roman, Ros and his team, uh, Ros Duncan, the head of software and his team. And, and they, this is the technique I was mentioning that they use to get them as small as possible. There is no theorem saying that this is the best you can do. But this, this, this is at the moment is the best, and it's built in. It's built in in the ticket compiler. So the continuum compiler uses this method to to optimize circuits. Yeah. Yeah. So not confluent. Not confluent. So, yeah, yeah, so this is a strategy. This is, this is a strategy that does that. So that's what they prove in the paper. This is a, it doesn't say that it's the best strategy, but it's a strategy that you will do better than before. So, so it's, it, it pushes you in one direction. And you'll, you'll see why, you'll get the gist of it when I, when I start explaining. Uh, okay, suppose you got something like this. So you got all this C not gate. You see this C not gate and this C not gate. They really want to cancel out, but there is this phase in the middle which is preventing them to cancel out. And if this would have canceled out, then this would have canceled out, but it's this phase in the middle blocking everything. What can you do? Uh, it looks pretty bad. What can you do? Not much. OK, I'm going to look at this, this little thingy alone. Everybody has an, anybody has an idea what I'm going to do now? Look a little bit. It's always the same rules we use. Let me, that, that's my advice. There, there aren't really that many. How many rules do we have involving two colors? Square. You, there is a square here. There is a square here. Look. I, I mean, I, I made it very explicit, but if you fuse these two together, if you fuse these two, two together, then I've got green dot, red dot, red dot, green dot, red dot. There's a square sitting inside. And now I make it very explicit here. So, so you, if I fuse this green and this green together, it becomes one, right? And then so I've got one green, one red, one green, one red, and it's a square. Now you say, okay, but there is a phase sitting here, but I can pull the phase out. I can just unfuse the phase. And here, here you say, okay, you've got a bunch of wires coming in there. I unfuse that. So, just to, so this wire is connected to green. This wire is connected to green. Here, this wire is connected to green. This wire is connected to green. That wire is connected to red. 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 And in between the two red ones, there is a phase. You see, it's the same. Yeah? It's, so I unfuse this to find a square. So that's a more, more non-trivial use. But you pretty much, this is actually all you really need to do to simplify circuits in this strategy. Just getting rid of a phase which is obstructing. So let's see what happens now. So we got the square here, number four and number two, number four and number two. So they are going to get connected to a red dot. We got number three and number one, they're connected to, to, to red, so they're going to get connected to green. And now then we connect the green and the red dot. So what we obtain is this. We obtain a thing like that. So this thing, which is like a very annoying thing, becomes a thing with only green dots. And this, this, you see, this is not at all anything anymore like a circuit made up of, of, of unit trees. This is not, nothing anymore like a circuit made up of unit trees. It doesn't look like that at all with this thing hanging out. And now, now let's see what happens. So now we have this configuration again I started from. And because we can now stick in this one, you see now all this green commutes through each other. So you actually turned a red thing into a green thing. And you've got a lot of commutation going on now. And up, 
So basically, these two can now cancel out because this is a green spider and a red spider connected by two wires. And so this thing simplifies to this thing. So we were able to cancel out these two C0 gates. And this is, this is a confluence strategy. It takes you in one direction, and it always, it's always going to simplify your circuits. I'm not saying that you can do every simplification like that, but you, you definitely are going in one direction. And this scales. So we saw this little thing. If actually you got something like this, then it becomes this. And if you got something like this, it becomes this. And this thing is what people call phase gadgets. So basically, the strategy to simplify circuits is to turn as much as possible stuff into phase gadgets, which nicely commute through each other because they're all they all on the same color. They're all the same color, so they commute through each other. So that's the usual that's that's the sort of professional strategy that people now use. Like I said, it's not necessarily at this point we don't know whether it's the best possible one, but it actually is the best practical one that exists now. Louder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I have even been told. I mean, that this sort of representation for an iron trap quantum computer is actually more native than the circuit representation. So this, this is actually something that physically is closer to the, to the thing you can actually do on top. But, but the main thing is you see all these green dots. They just commute through each other. So they all commute through each other. Yeah. No, there, there may be obstructions you just don't get rid of like this. Or maybe the abstraction is just long get rid. It's it's not known. It's not known. At this point, it's not known. This all this this sort of circuit simplification stuff is a very recent development. It's not something people have been doing for ten years. It's like a couple of years max that people have been doing this because it was not a question people were asking before. There was there actually were quantum computers. It's a, it's a, something the, the mainstream community never really thought about, and now it's a very important thing. Okay, yeah. Actually, we can take a little break, but yeah, keep asking questions. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Doesn't have? Well, I mean, I mean, it can be decomposed into gates. I just showed you. This, this is a phase. This is a phase. Oh, sorry. This is a phase gadget, and this is decomposition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you take basically what you do is you start with something like this. You move to these ones, you simplify, and then you move back. Yeah. I mean, it, dep it, it, it all depends on the hardware you're working with. It depends on the hardware you're working with. Uh, on, like I said, on. on, on, on <clears throat> on, for example, the, the, the quantum quantum computers, these things are, pre, are quite kind of native to what you actually implement. Okay, okay. Let's let's show some now actual examples. So what I'm represent these are these are sort of the Bell states, and the Bell states can be represented in ZX calculus. Like the Bell state is just the cup. The the one we've in mind is you just take a, a green pie. The, the here, this, this one, you stick the knot basically to get this one, and if you stick both, you get this. So we can represent these bell states, which we use, which you use in, 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 many, in, in many, many protocols like this. And you can also say, you say a cup, you could actually, as a circuit, realize like this. If I take like a, a plus state and a zero state, and I apply a C not gate, I get a cup, and so on. You see, I'm just decompo I'm just like, I'm fusing these into little circuits. We'll, we'll see that later. We'll see that later why we need it. I'll, I'll get back to this. 
So this is just the representation, the ZX calculus for uh, these bell states. Now, okay, let's, let, let's derive quantum teleportation. Uh, this, is actually the, this is actually the first diagrammatic thing. This goes back to 2003 or something like that that we did. So you got Alice and you got Bob. They share a bell state, they share a bell state, and Alice has a state psi that she wants to get to Bob. So how are you gonna do that? Intuitively. Yeah, you can, you can draw it in the air. Yeah, 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 indeed. You just stick a cup, cap there. And now, this one up is all the way to Bob. That's how simple it is. So this is what's called post-selected teleportation. This is that you, you do a bell measurement and you just hope that you get this one, this outcome. As you do a bell measurement, you just hope that you get the right outcome. That, that's basically what this is. Now, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's as if you can slide this box there. No, no, oh, many times the same thing. Okay, that was actually pretty cool. Up, 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 up. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is what we have, but it may be the case that you don't just get the expected uh, outcome here. So there's four possible outcomes which I indicate by either a zero or a pi there, or a zero or a pi. And of course I'm referring now, I'm referring to these four possible bell states, which are the four possible effects you can have in a bell measurements, those four. So I indicate them here. So th these, these are four possible outcomes now we can have. Now what do you do? So Alice picks up the phone, tells to Bob which thing happened there, and Bob undoes the same using phase gates. Yeah. And then, but of course, there's a telephone call necessary to do that. And this is teleportation. This is this full-blown teleportation. Is this clear? So here you've got the the outcome of your measurement, four possibilities, and Bob does the corresponding correction. All right? Uh, clear, everybody? So this is how the derived tele teleportation is. Now, what is really annoying here is that I've got this orange curly wire here. I mean, this is for old people who, who had these telephones with this curly thing still. I mean, I think there's probably two, two here in the room <laughs> who ever had a telephone like that. Uh, and, and, and that, that was not part of a language. This is not spider. So later we're going to see how you can actually substitute this wire with spiders too. How, and how this classical stuff also can become spiders. Uh, okay, measurement-based quantum computing. That's what the optical quantum people are doing. Yeah? Well, I mean, the, so, so basically there are two readings. There are two readings here. One reading is that with time that flows up. So initially you've got this psi state and you've got this cup state. And then at the later time, you've got this cup effect. So that's sort of the operational reasoning, reading, if you want. This is like really how the processes take place in space and time. But then there is also some sort of logical reasoning. And that's really the math, the semantics. And the semantics allows you to slide this box all the way there. So, uh, I mean, I mean peep, the, the, so e, e, even in the very beginning, when, when, when Bennett and, 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 and all these people came up with teleportation, they were already talking about the fact that it felt as if the state was sort of sent backward in time, as if. Uh, but, of course, that doesn't really work because that's against relativity theory. <laughs> so, so, but it's it, it sort of log logically you can reason as if you can push the state back in time. That's, that's... I mean, that's, that's an entire discussion in its own right, basically. I mean, this is entanglement, this is entanglement, and this is entanglement. So entanglement, pairs of entanglement, an entangled state and an entangled effect, allow you, in principle, to send stuff faster than light, but it's not true. The reason it's not true is because 
you're never sure which outcome you're going to get in this measurement. And so in order to get this corrected at the other side, in order to get this corrected at the other side, you need to make a phone call. So you can't violate. So this, this is, this, it's a very subtle thing about quantum mechanics. Non-locality is a very subtle thing. It's, you can't use it to send information, but something is going on between distant parts, something that you can't use to send. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is a similar, there's a similar analysis you can do of teleportation in that sense. It's, initially, it seems as if you can signal, but then this telephone line is, for, for, is pre preventing it. OK. Measurement-based quantum computing. I don't know if, if you hear about that. That's now what all the photonic quantum computing companies are trying to establish, because you get some sort of fault tolerance for free. I'm going to show you a very simple example of measurement-based quantum computing. So you've got a state here. You've got a state here. It's a little bit like teleportation. I've got a state here, and then now you look at this circuit. I've got a C0 gate. I've got a zero state. I've got like a, there a plus test. And you see the green fuses together, the red fuses together. So really, it's just the state. Yeah? And the state ends up at the other side. This is not very interesting. Now, things become much more interesting if the measurement that I do here is against a certain phase. So I do measurement at a phase and see what happens now. Green phase uh, fuses. Red fuse, and now I have, by actually doing a measurement against alpha, I actually have applied the alpha gate to psi. So I'm using a measurement to apply a gate. And the measurement ang angle defines which gate I'm actually applying. And again, I have to do the sort of correcting thing, but that's no problem if I got alpha or alpha plus pi. And then I do the corresponding correction. So this is actually a way by means of measuring and applying certain fixed gates, just pi or not, to actually apply an arbitrary gate. And there are arguments to do that, and that it actually is much more fault tolerant than doing the gate, just applying the gates themselves. <clears throat> so that was the idea of measurement-based quantum computing, which now goes back to 2001 or something like that. And here, here's a little nice elegant calculation which is the sort of thing you, which is basically impossible to do in Hilbert space in any elegant way. So I've got psi state and a bunch of uh, plus states here. And what I'm applying here, what I'm applying here is actually what's called a, a control Z gate. It's called a, control, a CZ gate. And the way you write it down is basically two green dots with a Hadamard in the middle. Okay, let's see what happens with that. All the green stuff's gonna fuse together and you get this. And now we're going to do measurement-based quantum computing. So we got, this is what people call a cluster state. This is called a cluster state, if you hear that name. This is called a cluster state. And now if I pick my angles like alpha, beta, gamma here, and, and my measurement directions, you see, they fuse together. They fuse together. Here we got beta in a green beta in between Hadamars, so it's going to change the color. It's going to change, the, oh, sorry. It's going to change the color, and then I've got an alpha and a gamma. These two Hadamars are going to cancel each other out. And what I end up with, what I end up with is really this, arb, this is an arbitrary unitary, arbitrary one qubit unitary applied to psi. So this, so this sort of, so basically what I've been doing, let's go back, just by measuring, just by three measurements, just by doing three measurements, and I can do them in parallel. I can do them in parallel, these three measurements. That's actually where the fault tolerance comes from. I actually have applied an arbitrary one qubit gate. And this is a paradigm for computation. This you can show gives you universal computation. And that's what Psi Quantum is trying to build. That's what Xanadu is trying to build. That's what Quandela is trying to build. They're doing this. They don't, they don't do circuits. They do this. Classic. Okay, um, let's do a few min minutes pause. Yeah? Like till 20 past. Eh? Oh, I'm not done, eh? Hello? Quoi? 
différence avec quoi Avec les Tensor Network. Ah
Huh? How was the first one? The, the, the first session. You mean th this one just now? Yeah. It was okay? I was watching, I was watching online. Yeah. Ah, you could. I, I, I insulted you. Okay. Okay, everyone, we're going to do something really exciting now. I think this is always the most. Uh, so, basically, so far, he signed a picture with teleportation that I had to represent the telephone by some curly little thingy. And that's, of course, not very elegant. We really want to have the whole story in pictures. The whole story, as in, like, also the classical communication and. For example, in measurement-based quantum computing, there's a lot of classical computation going on. You want to get this all in pictures, everything in pictures. Yeah, that's, that's the goal now. Uh, so we have to come up with a paradigm on how we distinguish something that is classical from something that is quantum, like classical computation, like a data versus like quantum systems. And in a way, von Neumann already knew how to do that. Von Neumann already knew this in a way. So basically what we're going to do, and this may seem ad hoc, like if I just draw a diagram like this, I will always think of it as classical. So what we've been drawing so far, these diagrams, I'm now going to think of all of them as classical. Of course, there can't be any phases, because that doesn't mean anything phases classically. And, and this, this will be automatic, as you will see. Now, if this is classical, what is quantum? Well, quantum simple is everything doubled. You just draw everything twice. That's quantum. So if, if you see single wires, it's classical. If you see double wires, it's quantum. And this, this is something you actually already know, but you didn't realize. Uh, so, oh yeah, yeah, I should say, if you double, what you have to do is then, if, if I've got an alpha phase here, then the other one should be the conjugate. In the, in the doubled picture, everything should be conjugate. So you got something, a picture, and it's conjugate. And that's quantum. And uh, so you can write it like this. It's a bit, it's a bit more elegant. It takes less space. Uh, let, let's now see why this is the case. Why double corresponds to quantum and single corresponds to classical. Uh, I mean, intuitively, if you think of density matrices, if you think going from pure states to density matrices, what do you do? You take psi, psi ket, and psi bra. So you double it. Now, taking psi ket and psi bra is actually the same as taking psi ket and ket conjugate. It's the same thing. And that's really what we're doing here. So we move from a ket to a ket and its conjugate, just like you do in density matrices. Uh, OK. And so, OK, here is a spider. Two inputs, one output. What is this? This is a measurement. This is a measurement. This is what philosophers have written 100,000 papers about in 100 years. Measurement problem. This is a measurement. It's just a spider. Two inputs, one output. What is this? One input, two outputs. OK, this is encoding classical data as a quantum state. This is encoding classical data as a quantum state. 
So, the, so going from quantum to classical and back is actually very simple now. It's also just using spiders. Uh, so okay, so how would this look? Suppose I've got a density matrix here. This is a density matrix. Eh? I've got on the diagonal P and one minus P, and then I've got some off-diagonal Z and maybe Z bar. If you apply this, so you remember this is an operation which now you have to read this backwardly. It takes zero, zero in, spits zero out. It takes one, one in, spits one out, which means it only takes in the diagonal elements. It gets rid of the off-diagonal elements. And so you see, some dense matrix like this would actually turn into this probability distribution. So we got a probability distribution here. So if you got a density matrix, if you take this density matrix and you measure it with the Z observable, then this would indeed be the probabilities for your two possible outcomes. So it, it does what you expect it to do. It does what you expect it to do. Uh, the encoding, the encoding takes a probability distribution and just lays it off on the, di on the diagonal. So it's what you would expect it to be. So this is just plain quantum representation of this. Now we can do stuff again. Okay, so this, this is, I take classical data, I encode this as a quantum state, and then I measure it in the same basis. It's not a very useful thing to do, because what comes in goes out. That is a lot of work for nothing. So this is, so again, encoding, measuring, does nothing. Uh, okay. So the measurement and encoding, blah, blah, blah. Now, I measure in, I encode in one basis and I measure in the other basis. So I, I encode in, in uh, Z and I measure in X. Now, Z and X are mutually unbiased. They're as far apart as possible as they can. And the probabilities for any outcome if, or in red will, will be equal for any basis vector in green. So we get this. This actually is randomness. This, this represents the state of randomness. So nothing that goes in comes out. Everything is lost. This is deletion. You, get, you delete your input and you get randomness. See, this simple equation which we saw before tells you now something about what happens if you encode and then measure in different colors. Uh, okay, I said that. So this, this, these are basically just, this is the state, this is the uniform probability distribution associated with the, let's, let's go back. This is the uniform probability distribution associated with the green measurement. This is the uniform probability distribution associated with the red measurement. So, so we discover something new. So these are classical things. Uh, and let, I'm, I'm going to remind you that this measurement is actually measurement against the red basis, and this measurement is actually measuring against the green basis. I said this before. So that's the only thing you have to be careful with. Don't get this wrong. Don't get this wrong. Okay, this is a non-demolition measurement. So sometimes you do measurements and then the system still exists. Like in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in, in our ion trap computers, you can actually do that. You can measure something and the thing is still there. It just collapsed, it just collapsed. And so this is a, this is a measurement with collapse. Let, let's disentangle it. So here you got quantum in, you got quantum out and classical out. And really what this is, is you got a measure. It, this is as if you do a measurement, then you copy the outcome and then you encode again. And this actually corresponds to the, to the collapse. So, you could, so this is really is the collapse which is happening here. And now you can see this internal spy, this collapse of the wave package, like people say. Okay, so I got two measurements, non-demolition measurements, one in Z, one in X, and let's see what happens if we compose them. So suppose we do first a Z measurement, then an X measurement, and then a Z measurement. This is sort of the, the, the question philosophers asked very early on in quantum mechanics, say, okay, if I observe this, and then I do another measurement, and then I observe it again, of course, we would expect to get twice the same. That's what the philosopher said. But if we do the calculation, we see two wires in the middle there, they just vanish. So this one is completely disconnected from this one. There's not going to be any connection between them. And this is pretty much going to be randomness, and this is going to measure whatever comes in. So you see, this, this, and this is, this is also, the technique, oh, who, who knows about quantum key distribution? Yeah, yeah. So this is also the, the reason quantum key distribution works. So Alice encodes in a certain basis, and Bob measures in, a, in, in, in the corresponding basis, and then if Eve is messing in the middle, it's going to break down the correlations between Alice and Bob's measurements. 
and they can then detect that there has been an intruder. That's really how quantum key distribution works. It's because of this phenomenon. Okay, I've seen that. Okay, this is also an interesting one. So these are all very simple calculations. So <coughs> suppose I've got a phase, a state with a phase, state with a phase, so a non-trivial state. And I'm going to see what happens if I measure it. So I said these two have to be conjugate. These two have to be conjugate, so they're going to cancel out. So this is kind of saying that if I go from quantum to classical and I measure, all the phases vanish. So phases is something that has no counterpart in the classical world. They get eliminated. OK. So now you understand. So this is the dodo. So you, you can actually buy these t-shirts with this dodo if you want to. So you have to look on Etsy for Dave the Dodo t-shirt. And I can advertise this because I'm not making money with it, because my co-author, Alex Kissinger, takes all the money. <laughs> so it, it, I mean, it, these days, many quantum scientists go work for companies. And he, he said, OK, I'm also going to do a company for t-shirts. Dodo t-shirts. Oh, you can also get mugs and stuff like that. But the, the, what I'm sh showing this, this is really teleportation, this little picture. You know, so you see you've got this cup state. You've got this cup state. This is what's coming in. This is the incoming state at Alice's end. This really is the bell measurement. This is the classical communication of your two measurement outcomes. And this is the correction. So this is now how it looks, teleportation, just as a picture and nothing more than a picture. Uh, so that's kind of cool. I mean, here, here it's, so this is what we had before, these two possible measurement outcomes, these two possible corrections. What we do now is we use this representation in terms of circuits. We use this representation in terms of circuits of these bell states. So we, do, well, we turn it upside down. We get this, we get this, and now we just need to do a measurement here and a measurement there to get actually these outcomes there. That's what we do, and this is full teleportation with classical and quantum wires, everything inside. OK, I said that again. OK, I think this is more or less the last thing I'm going to do before questions. Let me check. Do I, let me check. What else do I have? Oh, oh so I'm going backward. I think do I have anything? No, that's, that's the last thing I have. So this is, this, is from the, this is from the kids book. This is from the kids book. Eh? This is in here. And what is this? This is the proof, the proof of non-locality. This is a proof of quantum non-locality for kids. And it, it involves both classical and quantum wires. Let's, let's, does anybody who, who knows sort of the Mermin architecture, the Mermin proof for quantum non-locality using a GHZ state? Nobody? That's the most, it's much more elegant than bell inequalities, but OK. So, so basically, what you got is like, so what you got here on the bottom are three, four GHZ states. It's actually one GHZ state, but in four different scenarios. So you got a GHZ state here. And then you got some rotation here. You see, you got some rotation. This is doing nothing. There's no, and this is like doing a 90 degree rotation. Uh, this, this is a rotation around, around, the, around, around the X axis. A rotation around the X axis, 90 degree, 90 degree. So, so basically you got a GHZ state. Here I do nothing. There I do two rotations to the two last particles. Here I do a rotation to the first and the last. Here I do a rotation to the two first ones. And then I do a measurement. So basically, I'm actually taking this, this, these, are, these are Z measurements, and I'm, I'm actually rotating them, the Z measurements, to a Y measurement. So these are actually, the, the 90 ones are actually Y measurements, and the zero ones are actually Z measurements. So I'm doing four different measurement scenarios on this GHZ state. That's what I'm doing. I've got a GHZ state, and I'm considering four different measurement scenarios with this, with using these different rotations. And what I do then is I take all the classical data together and apply a red spider to it. So what does a red spider do to classical data? It's a parity test. It's, it's, it's like an XOR, but it's like a generalized XOR. So it's like a parity test. It sees whether the outcomes are either even or odd. So, I mean, this is something you can do in the laboratory. Yeah? As Eilinger did this in the laboratory. So I've got these four scenarios, four measurement scenarios, and then I basically measure the parity of the whole thing. Now, 
What? No, I'm going to. I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to do the calculation just like that in my head. So basically, do you remember? Do you remember that we had this rule for the squares, and I said it's like commutation. Green and red sort of gets exchanged. Remember, I said this commutation. So, so you can actually use this rule here to actually move these red dots above the green dots, and then the green dots are going to vanish. And so then basically what you have is I've got 90 degree, 90 degree, 90 degree, 90 degree, and 90 degree, and 90 degree. So I end up with 180 degrees. So I will, and then ultimately you just end up with this thing, no wires anymore, with 180 degrees. That's really the computation you do here. I mean, I didn't put the slides in, but it's quite an easy thing to do. Okay, now, so this is, this is what quantum mechanics tells you. This is what quantum mechanics tells you. If I do these four scenarios, I get... 180 degrees there, which is actually one, which is the classical state one. With a zero, it would be the classical bit zero. This is the classical bit one. You get the classical bit one here. Okay. Now we're going to assume that there is a local hidden variable model. That's what non-locality is about. Local hidden variable model means that whatever these measurements are, Whatever these measurements are that we are here, we've got one, two, three measurements. We've got this measurement on the first system and these measurements on the first system. So one with zero and one with 90. One with zero and one with 90 on the second system. One with zero and one with 90 on the third systems. So there are six, six different measurements we need to consider. Six different measurements we need to consider. And so this is the first measurement that's getting the zero, uh, that's with, and this with the 90. Second, measure, second system measurement with the 0 and with the 19, third system measurement with the 0 and 90, and we assume that there are variables determining the measurement outcome. That's, that's what the local hidden variable model is. So for each of these measurements, there's a variable, and so we copy these variables out, we copy these variables out to these four different measurement scenarios we have. So this is really just copying them out to the four, so the four different measurement scenarios live somewhere here. And then we do the parity test. So this is what a local hidden variable tells us. And what do you see? Anybody knows how to simplify this? No? We got red dots, we got green dots, we got wires between red and green dots. Yep. You see, between every one of these green dots, and this is because of the choice of the scenarios, the way it was made, there's exactly two wires to the red. So they vanish. So basically what we get is a red dot with nothing inside, which is the bit, which is the bit zero. So we got bit zero here. We got bit one there. So quantum mechanics gives you bit one. Local hidden variable theory gives you bit zero, and zero is not equal to one. So we have a contradiction. So whatever quantum mechanics, whatever quantum mechanics predicts in this particular scenario, is in contradiction with whatever a local hidden variable model could ever give you. So quantum mechanics is non-local. And this is now entirely just in picture, so that this is in honor of this year's Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, Zeilinger came to ask me two weeks ago to sign his copy of quantum in pictures. So that, that was pretty cool. So he's the one who came up with this idea and did it in the lab. And that's why he got his Nobel Prize pretty much. For, for this experiment. I think I, I can stop here. It's been long. I've got nothing more to say. So I'll leave it to questions now. So I'll, let, let me just end up with this. Uh, any questions? If you have questions, raise your hand. I'll bring you a microphone, actually. Yeah, sorry, I would like to go back to the question I asked before because I didn't really get uh, the whole answer. So I understand that, uh, I mean, when you have a, a real quantum device, for instance, the one of continuum, it's not like as simple as just applying a CNOT gate. You have to implement it physically, and this makes sense. So uh, what I didn't understand is if you have this complicated uh, CNOT stack and you want to translate it into the phase gadget, that, that's really cool. But uh, 
Did you say that the phase gadget is what you can actually apply physically in this uh, quantum device? I'm, 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 yes, I mean, I'm not a specialist there with the, on, on the hardware implementation, but on specifically for iron, uh, for iron traps, they're in a way more native than your usual quantum gates. I mean, I mean, in photonics, people use completely different, I mean, like the measurement-based thing which I explained, that's what people are trying to build at Psi Quantum, not gates, because it's much more natural to do that sort of stuff with, with light, with light, than, uh, than, than the usual gates. Oh. So different architectures will have different implementations. It's not just all gate-based. Thank you. And, and, and like I said in the beginning of the talk, with photonics, it's sort of encoding of qubits. They do something like dual rail encoding and stuff like that. It becomes really complicated to describe this in Hilbert space, not the same possible. So they're all using these diagrams now to, to basically, yeah, reason about their program, reason about the error correction and stuff like that. And at Quandella in France, they're doing the same. They're also just using the diagrams for, for everything now. Uh, that this is the place where this is now the, the, the number one language. Quantum photonics. Uh, so, uh, so I have another question uh, uh, here. Uh, okay. So thank you for the wonderful lecture. Yeah, the, the uh, sound comes from here for me. Oh. <laughs> I never know. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I have two questions uh, actually. The first one is: so would you say that uh, ZX calculus or like what what you showed us today is more natural for optical like photonics, right, uh, than get based architectures? So, so, uh, so I, can, I can tell. So the hist so basically. Ross Duncan and I, we came up with the X-Calculus, uh, trying to look at a problem in measurement-based quantum computing, specifically to do with what's called generalized flow. Because in this, it doesn't look like this measurement-based quantum pattern. So you've got a very complicated state, and then you start doing measurements all over the place. And uh, there are some criteria which tell you when you can actually translate this to, into a circuit and not, and, and, and stuff like that. And it was looking at a problem like that that we actually came up with the X calculus. So the X calculus actually came out of measurement-based quantum computing, so it's not a surprise, it's quite useful for it. And on the other hand, when, when you actually want to work with beam splitters, beam splitters and stuff like that, then it turns out that there, there's a different calculus than the X calculus that's quite useful, which is called ZW calculus, which is something Alex Kissinger and I did in 2010. And uh, in the way we now are reasoning about photonics, we actually mix the two up. See, because for some things, the, having the, the W is more useful around than for other things, having the Z and the X is, and uh, Richie who's here, you can talk to Richie about it. He's, he's not asleep anymore. <laughs> huh? So you can talk to him, he's do, do, doing a lot of work on that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, so, uh, for the second part of the question, uh, uh, you mentioned about beam splitters. Like, so any other um, quantum optics or like photonics experiments or like uh, you know b basic stuff can be explained by Z uh, ZW calculus, right? Could you give a small illustrative example, like so, like uh, any other useful practical uh, that we see in photonic quantum computing? Oh. Uh... So, so ju just, I mean, just compil I mean, just compilation, just compiling circuit circuits to optical. Uh, that's something we are now developing at the moment, specifically for Quandella. Mm -hmm. uh, Kraji is here; is involved in that sort of collaboration, and we're going there, and uh, and we're going to do similar uh, similar stuff for Psi Quantum. Now, wh where they use these diagrams, it's really in their calculation uh, of error correction stuff and fault tolerance, and it's super complicated. You should look at this paper from Naomi, I, I put on. You, should, you should go and look in the sort of diagrams you find there. They're, they're just too, they're so big and it would be completely impossible. Let me go back. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. Come on. So if you go in that one, then you, you find tons of applications. And you, you should just imagine trying to do these things with Hilbert spaces from the pictures you're going to see in there. Oh, and I think they have, a new, they, have a new, they have a new paper out, too, like I think a few weeks ago, where they even do more complicated stuff. So my slides are a bit outdated. But Thank you so much. Sorry. One last quick question for me. Uh, what is the relationship between uh, tensor networks and the x delta calculus? Okay, I just answered that question. It's a very good question. So, um, so on the one hand, say tensor networks and Feynman diagram, they're, they're in, the same, in the same space. 
They are a graphical representation of stuff you, you, you do in Hilbert space. But it's just like, it's, it's, you have a calculation in Hilbert space and they will help you to do something there with that calculation. They are not a substitute for Hilbert space. You, do, you use them to guide your calculation in Hilbert space. This stuff lives in its on its own. This stuff lives on its own. You don't need Hilbert space anymore. You can completely forget about it. I mean, I'm, I'll tell this afternoon a little bit history, like, uh, like the sort of the historical development of these sort of ideas. I will talk about that this afternoon. But so we've got a genuine substitute of a Hilbert space here. And, every, and you do everything in the calculus. You never go back to Hilbert space. So that's different. It's a, it's a complete logical axiomatization of Hilbert space, while a tensor network, network is like a, a calculational aid when you're working in Hilbert space. I mean, these are tensor networks. You can think of them, but they're sort of a very, very precise, well-defined tensor networks. In many cases, tensor networks have a lot of variables inside. So, okay, a matrix product state or something like that. So they're not fully defined. Here we, we, we work with exactly defined entities, and all you need is the rules I showed you. There is no such thing as a, the tensor network calculus that lets you compute everything you want. But these are tensor networks, a very special example of tensor networks. I don't think anybody can hear that. Yeah. <laughs> There's been some work out there where people use ZX calculus to rewrite ZX diagrams to make them as small as possible and then use tense networks to contract it, leading to faster tense network contractions. So you can use, you can combine ZX techniques and tense network techniques and also stabilize the decompositions. So So if I understood it, uh, can you also uh, like do some expectation value calculation if you have density matrix? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I mean, uh, in one calculation, I said I throw away the numbers. But basically, the numbers in the doubled world, so you got a number multiplied with this complex number, uh, with this conjugate, so it's a positive number. So basically, you, you would just draw, uh, I mean, this, the, the, the example of GHZ, which I gave, is not like actually a probabilistic process. It's, a, it's, it's an exact thing. But a closed diagram like that would usually give you a probability. The diagram would become a number. And that's the probability. Ah, OK. And so like, let, if, I, if I imagine like quantum chemistry, so you have like molecular basis and like so a certain basis to compute. So in this case, what's the input and output basis would look like? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not involved in that, but I know that some of our people are talking to Nathan there, and they're starting to do some quantum chemistry using ZXW. Oh, Richie, you're involved in that, right? Yeah. So we, we only just start to apply, but this, this is basically full-blown quantum mechanics. The, this, the, the entire quantum formula is everything is there, probabilities, everything. So whatever you can do in quantum, you can do here. But it's all just as a diagram. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, th th this is just for two by two tense products, essentially, whereas quantum chemistry would require more general basis states. But th I think that's what Harney is working on yeah, yeah, yeah. at the moment. So. With, with this ZXW in higher dimensions. Yeah. OK. If, if we are done, I got one more thing to say. Are we done? Yeah, so, so who has a copy of this one? That, that's bad luck, because everybody's going to get one for free now. Ha <laughs> ha. They're there. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Uh, so can you uh, like ex explain again this uh, deformation of the uh, rectangle? Uh, like, uh, oh. how do you uh, break down the rectangle again? Just turn it off. 
Oh, what happened? Oh, there. Yeah, this one? Yeah. So, is my microphone still on? Yeah. So, basically, oh, did I take this? Oh, no. So, you got four, four loose wires. You number them. They are like alternating colors. You take whatever's connected to green, and you connect to a red dot. You take whatever's connected to red, and you connect to a green dot, and then you connect those two. So, uh, in, in, in this case, if we, uh, if we take like uh, uh, this uh, red and the green on the other side, would that, will, that would be an equivalent representation. Would this be? So, if we take that uh, uh, green and the red on the right side, so that will be an equivalent uh, diagram. Oh yeah, this 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 inequality. Oh sorry, like uh, in the right in the right uh, in the right plot, if we take this uh, green and the red on the right side. Of yeah, yeah, the... that's all the same. Okay, okay. That's all the same. Like this crossing doesn't mean anything. Oh, okay, yeah, thanks. Crossing doesn't mean anything. You have to think of these like wires lying on the table. So there is no crossing. The only thing that what mattered is what is connected to what. Okay. Like in electricity. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Hi everyone, so I have four announcements to make. First of all, come and queue up slowly to pick up your books. When you have your books, go back to your seat and we'll make a group picture while you just handle your books in the air. Uh, first thing, uh, yes, that was the second thing, take the book and uh, go back to your seat. Third thing is, I sent on Slack a Google spreadsheets about the assignment of the teams for tomorrow. 
please add your GitHub ID to the spreadsheet so that we can add you tomorrow to the GitHub repositories of your team. If you have any problem, send me a private message over Slack. And the fourth thing is for the Continuum people. We'll have the group picture just in the hall uh, after we're done with the books. Thank you very much, and you can start uh, queuing up for the books. Teams.